you see in the community as well. Um, I believe a great believer in keeping welcome short because we want to get to the meat of the symposium rather than listen to me rabbit on. And particularly when you have an accent like mine, you, you, you should rap it on as little as possible. Um, the community of practice, the Celt community practices the brainchild of Deirdre's, as, as Teresa said, and you see the community is delighted to be help support the initiative in any way we can. So, but huge thanks to Deirdre for driving the initiative. It's brilliant. We know there's lots of community engaged teaching going on in UCD, but UCD is, a, like many universities, a large place, and we often don't know, people don't get a chance to speak to each other about it. And so this is a great opportunity for colleagues and students to come together, share ideas, encourage each other, maybe inspire each other as well. Um, the title of the symposium, The Transformative Power of Community Engaged um, Learning, and I think that's probably what's in it for all of us here, that, that idea of transforming um, the way learning happens and that and it's and it's so powerful and this community engaged learning is, is fairly new to, I think, to most of us in the sense even though some people have been doing it for years but for many people it's a, it's, a, it's a new development so I'm delighted to support it in that and we're also very lucky to have Dr Helga Dorna who's from Hungary but I think joined us from Vienna today so welcome Helga and thank you to all the participants who are contributing and all you have joined as well and given up your time this morning. I think you'll find it very worthwhile. So without any further ado, I'll pass back. I think Deirdre is going to say a few words now. Oh, brilliant. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, you always bring a bit of light into the <laughs> occasion, which is fantastic. Um, I just briefly a welcome to everybody and to explain where um, the Celt community of practice came from. Uh, I sit and represent UCD on the Campus Engage Committee, looking at community engaged learning across the universities. And I met actually with Teresa and Holly, and we had a great discussion. And Holly's here today. Hi, Holly, who is a, a very key person in, in, in the uh, community of practice as well. Um, and we, we identified that there was a gap in an opportunity to bring people together to have conversations around community engaged learning. So we decided to establish the community engaged learning and teaching community of practice, the CELT, COP. Um, and the idea was really just to provide a space for people who were working in community engaged learning to come together and also for people who might be interested in exploring how to engage in community engaged learning in their practice. Um, so uh, I was actually lucky enough to get funding, funding from teaching and learning through the Learning Enhancement Project funding, and that has supported our uh, community of practice this year and allowed us to do things like have this symposium today. And the idea from the symposium actually came from the community as well um, through our discussions. Um, so it's just been wonderful to meet colleagues across the university and to hear about the amazing things going on in UCD around community engaged learning and teaching. Um, so that's the background to the Celt community of practice. If anybody's interested in finding out more, please feel free to reach out to myself or Teresa at any stage. And um, without further ado, what I'm going to do is introduce our keynote uh, speakers and um, let's start the, the symposium off. Um, the first person I'm going to introduce to you is Associate Professor Neve uh, Moore Cherry. So Neve Moore Cherry is Associate Pro Professor of Urban Governance and Development in the School of Geography. She's outgoing Vice Principal for Teaching and Learning, but also incoming Deputy Principal of the College of Social Sciences and Law. We're very lucky to have her. She's Honorary Professor at the Bartlett School of Planning, University College London. And since 2017, she has been a Principal Fellow of the UK Higher Education Academy in recognition of her international and strategic leadership of university teaching and learning. Neve's research is focused on understanding how cities are governed, how policy is developed and with what impacts. Neve engages with communities in both her research and her teaching. She co-leads the Reimagining Dublin, an interdisciplinary exploration and urban regeneration module on the MSc in Urban uh, Environment. And this module provides an introduction to an overview of the design of a more people-focused livable city. Uh, there is a focus on grassroots collaboration, developing students' understanding of the growing importance of giving communities a voice, which of course is really important in community engaged learning, um, and how both formal and informal processes can shape the public realm. Um, Neve places particular emphasis on the co-creative processes, collaboration and consultation. So Neve, thank you so much for chairing this discussion this morning. We're very lucky to have you here. 
And now to introduce our keynote speaker, who is Associate Professor Helga Dorner. Thank you, Helga, for, for joining us today. Helga is Associate Professor and Director at the Institute of Research on Adult Education and Knowledge Management at the Faculty of Education and Psychology of Utfish Laurent University, Hungary. She is also visiting faculty and researcher at the Central European University in Vienna, Austria. And before joining ELTE, she was a senior lecturer and director of the Centre for Teaching and Learning at the Central European University, Hungary. She was lead faculty of the Programme for Excellence in Teaching in Higher Education for Doctoral Students and taught courses in the field of teaching and learning in higher education and so socialisation of academics. She's also a fellow of the Higher Education Academy. She researches teaching innovations, academic professionalism and mentoring for teaching in higher education. So Helga, thank you so much for making the time for being here and we just can't wait to hear you speak and the theme for the keynote is from the individual to the collective creating community engaged learning experiences through faculty conversations so really looking for, forward to that so I'll stop talking now and hand over to Neve and Helga. That's great thanks very much um, Deirdre and um, it's great to be here and I feel really privileged actually to have been asked to chair this session so so thank you to everybody for that and it's a particular privilege to, um, to be chairing the session that Helga is speaking at um, because over the last while, since Deirdre asked me, I've been kind of looking at Helga's work and it's fascinating and I just can't wait to hear um, Helga's keynote and then to engage in conversation and discussion afterwards. So you don't need to listen to me, you can hear me anytime. I'm gonna hand straight over to Helga um, and say, Helga, you're very welcome to UCD and um, it's over to you. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I'm, I'm really honored. I mean, and, and such a warm welcome, despite being online. So, uh, of course, there is always this lack of um, immediacy and presence in these online symposia and conferences, but I feel like I'm sitting uh, with you in a large room certainly not in a lecture hall uh, where we would be lecturing at each other. So although my talk is called um, a keynote, I would rather say it is an invitation to reflect upon what we have um, learned, what we know about community engaged learning, and eventually how faculty conversations such as this one today may help us creating uh, community engaged learning experiences. So, so I would try to keep the time, the 20 minutes, and, and I hope that we will have a wonderful discussion afterwards. So let me try and share my slides, which is the next um, milestone. Oh, I am disabled to share my screen can somebody help me okay all right can you see my slide you're perfect Helga. okay thumbs up okay all right so um so when i was thinking about um what i should or could uh share with you I was thinking, okay, maybe, maybe I should create um, an opportunity for all of us to reflect, as I said, to reflect upon how um, conversations among faculty, among colleagues uh, may serve as a model for uh, creating uh, community engaged uh, learning uh, experiences. And also to maybe pose the question, what is uh, in common between uh, communities of practice created by faculty and um, community engaged learning experiences. In other words, how uh, such um, communities or experiences may be able to trigger and support uh, individual and collective transformations. So here are the questions for today. And um, first of all, I would like to share a couple of insights about the nature of faculty conversations. Uh, 
primarily based in, or grounded in research on those. Um, and then uh, I will talk about why faculty conversations such as this one today are needed, what is uh, basically the, the purpose and how it helps us. And then also I will try to focus on the context, the role of uh, context. And then I share a couple of insights from a, from a research that we have done in our own institution, uh, primarily uh, looking at uh, individual, the, the process from individual to the collective, eventually uh, among uh, faculty um, conversations. And then uh, I will hope to uh, talk about transformational, uh, the transformational nature or what is transformational about faculty conversations. And then I think I should arrive at the point that learning in faculty communities of practice and community engaged learning do have um, um, shared uh, features and they do indeed connect. So this is basically the roadmap. And um, let's look at the, the nature of faculty conversations. So maybe I should first start with what these are not. Um, so these are not uh, disorderly talks or uh, formless conversations, but of course these have um, social conventions and uh, of course they have uh, various uh, elements such as turn-taking, uh, there are the so-called listening moves, the repairing moves, um, holding the floor moves, which we may not even be conscious of, but certainly what is underlying um, actually faculty conversations is co-construction, that uh, faculty uh, come together to, to share ideas, to learn from each other, and to create new understandings eventually. And the other uh, very important underlying well, value, if you will, is certainly trust. In fact, a lot of research has confirmed that it does um, actually without trust, there are no sincere and, and collegial discussions. What forms can faculty conversations take? Um, we can talk about corridor conversations. Um, faculty may form formative mentoring groups within which they can um, talk about teaching, talk about university uh, issues, uh, professional issues, and we can create the so-called critical friends groups or talk to our critical friends. As you can see, there are uh, levels of um, informality and formality. Uh, if you look at the, the, these um, constellations or these uh, types, of course, there are plenty of other formats. I just uh, selected a couple so that I show that corridor conversations are more like the informal side, whereas the formative mentoring groups uh, reflect um, uh, for more uh, formal relationships eventually or more structured relationships. And in terms of the focus, what, what we tend to discuss in our faculty conversations, certainly um, uh, about um, implicit, explicit beliefs about teaching uh, or specific techniques or strategies, um, how to engage students, how to, uh, how to um, uh, engage them in the learning, uh, how to trigger learning conversations. These are uh, just, of course, uh, a selection of topics, uh, but um, I, I sort of thought these were the most common which came up uh, in the research on faculty conversations. And why are these conversations needed? So what does the research tell us about uh, the need eventually or what the purpose or what the why do we have these conversations 
um, because they enable to reflect on beliefs about teaching and student learning, as I have already mentioned that, change our understanding of teaching and learning eventually, uh, renew our faculty's teaching practices, but also to develop a culture of teaching and to uh, reinvigorate the values uh, of the teaching profession. And if you look at these um, five um, sort of reasons why we would need faculty conversations, then the first three ones are certainly, um, uh, the first three ones certainly focus on the individual learning or the individual perspective. Whereas if you look at the, um, the fourth one and uh, the fifth one, then you can see that these uh, individual learning paths, so to say, may become uh, a collective path or maybe sort of go out of the, um, of the individual or the smaller circle. Um, to eventually reach out to a much larger uh, audience. And I think, and it is not just Helga who thinks that, but also considerable research in the field, that this is of course not a straightforward road from the individual to the collective, because there is in, of course, the individual differences, um, that's one thing. And the other thing is certainly the contextual factors. So whatever we do as individuals and whatever we may be able to do as a collective uh, depends to a larger extent uh, on the institutional context. So the institutional context shapes teaching methods and pedagogical beliefs as it has been found um, in um, the research. And um, just to reinforce that, um, Chalmers and Gardiner shared um, a very insightful research about how the institutional context uh, shapes um, uh, individual or collective development around teaching and learning. And they say that there are institutions which are more characterized as providing a learning architecture, which means that all the policies, the processes are available, which ultimately recognize and support and reward excellent teaching. Whereas there is, there are institutions which are characterized as the, an, an, having an announcement culture. So what is learned actually about teaching, about learning, about uh, uh, professionalism in, in academia, if you will, or about research, research excellence, is encouraged and acknowledged at all organizational levels within the institution. So in fact, what, what we can say is that the individual development uh, actually is very much dependent on the contextual. So teaching is not only individually constructed, but also socially influenced. And it is actually situated in the institutional structure. So this is where we have arrived, actually when we um, conducted our research um, and we were having um, such conversations um, among faculty. And uh, in the period of from 2012 to 2020, we had 27 faculty conversations with uh, a total number of um, 520 participants. And, um, and we were looking at how these uh, conversations um, actually supported the individual knowledge creation, but also how these uh, how these conversations also supported the collective development of our faculty. And of course, the big question was, 
whether this results in any kinds of transformational experiences for our faculty. So we conducted um, 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 survey research as well as uh, interviews, and we used the grounded theory to analyze these interviews. Today, I'm just focusing on some of the findings from the interview analyses uh, so that I can make the claim that there is indeed development from the individual to the collective in various ways, but it also very much depends on the context. So here you will see um, um, quotes from our interviewees, and I will go one by one with the, um, the findings or some of the findings. So we have found that conversations in our context as well are conducive to teachers, university teachers, I mean, individual development. So this basically confirmed in, or we confirmed in our context as well, whatever uh, international uh, research uh, has found. And we also found that conversations may be able to scaffold collective learning within the institution. So many faculty interviewees uh, confirmed this. And, and in fact, if I may just step out from this research and say, whatever is happening uh, in, in your community of, of practice very much reflects this, that there is indeed a need uh, for collective learning and that collective learning may happen if the context is provided for those uh, learning experiences. And then we also found that contextual constraints uh, may impede individual development. So as much as co uh, context can be supportive of individual and collective um, engagement and learning experiences, uh, the context may, be, uh, may pose challenges to individual or collective learning. And here you can see a very powerful quote, in fact, from one of our colleagues. And by the way, these are pseudonyms, so not the real names of uh, our colleagues. And of course, we followed all the uh, uh, ethical uh, guidelines provided by the university. And of course, we have the permission to have conducted the research. Needless to say, um, and uh, conversations may be used to articulate a need for institutional support we have found. So at uh, this is actually the stage where we could identify uh, the need for the collective um, learning or the collectivity among our faculty. So what we concluded eventually is that there is much more to be done because the individual um, learning was much more articulate in the in interviews, whereas the collectivity of the experience and how we can learn from each other um, and how those experiences could be used to actually shape the context and to transform the context uh, did not come to the surface that um, uh, explicitly. Nevertheless, we have some uh, key considerations from our, for ourselves. And some of the, uh, the key considerations is that there is indeed uh, uh, a need for input to situate our own personal theories. So in other words, whatever we think about our context, whatever we think about our work should be shared and critics really reflected upon. And communities of practice or faculty conversations within communities of practice could serve this purpose. And the other main consideration is that the relationships among academics could be, should be based on the value of cooperation rather than competition. So this is, this is another important uh, consideration. And the third one, uh, uh, which we found in our research, is that we can create a collective autonomy, a sense of 
collective autonomy as faculty, through which we can actually initiate bottom-up institutional transformations if that's needed. So we sort of figure that that is, could be transformational or faculty conversations could uh, act as catalysts of transformations, if you will. And then, um, importantly, the path of changes within institutions starts from the individual development to move to a broader cultural and institutional transformation. So this was also, um, to some extent, confirmed in our case. Now, coming to this bigger question of, OK, so we've seen that there is a need for faculty conversations. We've seen that uh, they take uh, various forms. Um, and we've seen that um, uh, there is a transformational potential, but what is it exactly? Um, so our major claim is that conversations are different from the so-called standard academic discussions and debates because they engage participants at a more personal level. They give participants a significant level of autonomy. And again, comes the local uh, perspective that they are often focused on the local and more immediate matters, which is good, in fact, because then this is an invitation to also um, reflect individually and collectively and to lead us to an agreement and a deeper understanding rather than debating, right? And the other important, uh, so to say, claim about um, um, or referring to the question of what is transformational about faculty conversations is that conversations are not necessarily limited to individual development, but can ripple out from the group. So may induce broader cultural and institutional transformations and lead to the emergence of a community of practice. So this is where you are now, in fact with your community of practice, where the participants engage in a process of collective learning. And importantly, uh, these conversations within communities of practice may level relationships among academics by cultivating the norms of collaboration and collegiality rather than competition. So this is again, something which I would like to put on the table. And we can debate or discuss about this, of course, uh, later on. Now, the next question, which I actually promised to discuss, or at least to start, you know, thinking about it, is so. Okay, so how do then um, faculty um, communities of practice or faculty conversations? Um, how do they relate to the uh, community engaged learning? And I was trying to find, you know, the the those. Um, uh, values uh, in both um, uh, instances, which could be shared or which I think are shared values. The first one is reciprocity, certainly, where all learn from uh, and teach one another, right? This is what is supposed to happen in community engaged learning experiences. Then also critical refraction, right? Examination of interactions uh, among social cultural contexts cultural, historical, social, emotional, personal, and so on, so all the dimensions. So this is, in fact, happening when we are talking about our teaching research and, and uh, professional, um, so to say, uh, activities, and to some extent, identities. And of course, uh, there is mutual benefit, supposed to be a democratic relationship, right? And we are supposed to work uh, intentionally toward the public good. And institutional resources are used to address community needs in collaboration with that community. And I think when we talk about faculty groups, faculty um, communities of practice, this is exactly what is happening. And um, with uh, community engaged learning experiences, this is exactly what is happening. And then, I thought maybe how 
you know, how best to describe the relationship between faculty communities of practice and community engaged learning experiences. And then I sort of thought maybe um, place conscious pedagogies is a useful term here. And um, why? Because um, it extends the concept of reciprocity to include individuals interactions with and in places. So in my talk so far, I have referred to the role of context many times, how it supports and how it may impede uh, individual and collective learning among faculty. But the same goes for uh, community engaged learning um, sites eventually um, as place conscious, uh, sites for place conscious pedagogies. And reciprocal relationships are based on connection rather than difference. And again, when I talked about faculty being in collaboration rather than in competition uh, and faculty trying to identify, you know, what are shared experiences, what are shared solutions, the same applies here that these relationships are based on connection rather than difference. And of course, the third point, challenge power hierarchies where the needs, interests, and knowledge of one group are positioned ahead of the other. And I think this is, again, uh, something to, to think about in the context of um, developing um, institutions and how faculty can be drivers of certain changes, pedagogical, institutional um, uh, um, processes. I think I skipped this one and arrived to my conclusion, which I think is going to be the trigger for the discussion. So it's not really a conclusion, but as I said, an invitation to, to, to discuss uh, these ideas. So I think actually, um, as you can see uh, from my bubbles, so there is this notion of place conscious pedagogies. And I think faculty communities of practice are actually uh, a model or are, so to say, places of place conscious pedagogies, the same way as um, community engaged learning um, sites or experiences. And, uh, and just one final sort of idea, uh, place conscious pedagogies provide the opportunities for students and faculty to consider how culture, society, politics interact in the process of learning and placemaking. So, and this is where I stop. I hope I can stop sharing. Yes, I think I managed to stop sharing. Good. So, and I'm, I'm happy to continue the discussion. That's great, Helga. Thank you so much for that. Um, I can see people clapping, even though they were muted. Um, so there's there's wide applause in the room. Thank so you. thank you so much for that. Um, really inspiring talk, I think. Um, and, and really, as you said, to get, get the conversation going. Um, and I thought I would just kind of sum up what struck me really most about your, your work. And actually, it's really interesting because I've just been working with community groups on a research project and everything you said about faculty conversations is exactly the same as working with community groups in terms of research or teaching it, it, it doesn't matter and the importance of trust I think you really drew out really really well um, and I think without trust what becomes evident is that those conversations can't happen because there's a fear and a defensiveness around opening up those kind of spaces of learning and those those kind of collective spaces and, and what I thought was was really interesting as well is, is is that issue of trust. And what always strikes me about teaching is that it's very much seen as a, a private activity. It's an individual activity. You're, you're closed behind a door in a lecture theater with your students and, and nobody else is there. Whereas when we think about our research, it, it's always about the peer review. It's always about, you know, what our peers are going to think of it. And we're so reluctant to have those teaching conversations. And I think what you have given us is, is a way and a structure to think about having those conversations and the importance of them and, and what they can deliver for us. And the fact that they can be catalysts of transformation, that this isn't a, an administrative tick box thing, a good thing to do, but actually this is about real change and, and making re real change. And just as a geographer, 
your your reference to context and place based approaches, I think is just it just says so much to me. It speaks so much to me because I think what's really, really important about taking that place based element is that it allows us to think um, about the needs of those who are involved. And I think this is this is the real importance of community engaged learning as well, that it is about addressing real need. It's not about somebody from the top down thinking they know what a group of people, a community, a group of academics need or want, but actually listening from the ground up um, in terms of, of what is really the important and then put, you know being able to respond appropriately um, and responses that can be sustained. Because I think very often in, in teaching and learning initiatives that you know th there's loads of enthusiasm, but the ability to sustain them sometimes wanes uh, and I think what you're suggesting here is that by moving this from the individual to the collective, this cultural shift will actually be the way this becomes sustained because it becomes the norm. It, it opens up this space where, where we have these conversations. And I also, it really struck me as well, I suppose, and, and this is the final thing I'll say before opening it up to a wider conversation, but um, I think what you were saying really speaks to the, the whole agenda around decolonization of our institutions and of our curriculum. It speaks to the EDI agenda of having more inclusive teaching and learning, more diverse teaching and learning, because what you're speaking to here is about alternative knowledges, alternative ways of knowing and valuing alternative experiences. And I think actually that our curriculum, our work environment would be so much richer um, for having that kind of set of diverse experiences and those alternative knowledges. Um, front and center of what we do. So I want to thank you personally for a very inspiring talk that, that just sent loads of ideas flying around in my head, but I, I'd like to open it up to a wider conversation as well, as I'm sure we have lots of people um, who, who would like to chat. Thank um, you so much. I don't know what is happening now. Shall I check the chat or? I, I can, I've been doing that.